questions from the teaching last week? Any on pertinent questions? I dealt with the material, the material that we gave out. We've gone over several Hebrew words, Hebrew names for things already. I'll put these up again. Make sure you're familiar with these. Remember, in each one of these books of the Pentateuch, we'll be taking a look at the Hebrew name because a lot of our names have come either from the Greek or from the uh, Jerome's Latin version of the Bible, written around 400 A.D. That's where we've got a lot, not all, of our English names. Put the names of God up here again, several names. We'll be looking at these names of God in Old Testament theology, which would come under biblical theology because God progressively revealed himself by a variety of names. We've got, of course, uh, the first book that I had written. I had a short teaching in there on the seven compound covenant names of God in the Old Testament. Those were the compound names. There were many other names besides those. But just to refresh your memory here, it's what we've gone over thus far. The Hebrews call the book of Genesis better sheaf because in the first verse we've got in the beginning better sheaf, bara Elohim, Hashemayim, Weha Adarit. So the Jews had their first book memorized as better sheaf. And I think I've got that written somewhere. I didn't mean to get to this this evening. We'll be on this. Let's see. After we get through with the Pentateuch, the, the actual Hebrew of these words. Bereshit, the Toledot. There are, uh, Moses has divided the book of Genesis up into 11 divisions. With the exception of the first division, all of the divisions begin with these are the Toledot. So you need to be familiar with the Toledot, what the word means and where these Toledotes are found. Remember back in the first chapter of Genesis, we have this name appearing of God throughout, Elohim. Then in chapters 2 and 3, we have these two names gathered together, Yahweh Elohim, which is what gave rise to the popular theories that we covered, such as the documentary theory. Because the Stroop, remember the French physician, Catholic turned Protestant, 1753, in his book, saw right away that these names were different in going from chapter 1 to chapter 2 and 3 to chapter 4, and we end up with this name, Yahweh. This is the other name I didn't write. It's the name that we mentioned over in Exodus, chapter 6, and I believe verse 2 or verse 3, and that was God Almighty, El Shaddai. Remember there, this is the problem text that we uh, skirted around. It's not a problem to us. You might still think it's a problem to you. It's not a problem to me, but I hadn't let the cat out of the bag yet and probably won't until we get over there and maybe later on past that. But that's God Almighty, El Shaddai, where uh, God is, is speaking to Moses there and said, I didn't reveal myself to the patriarchs or to your fathers by my name Yahweh, but by God Almighty which we see God does in Genesis 17 and verse 1, where he appears to Abram and says, Walk before me and be thou perfect, because I am El Shaddai. Well, does that go all the way through? No, it doesn't. It goes through for me. I've got all the names on here. We'll be to those. If you can get that copy down, I'll leave it up there for a few moments. Better sheets in Hebrew. Can you see that well enough? Comes through up here. I can see right through the paper and see the rest of these, but I don't. You can't. So, no, don't write any scribbling. Write it in Hebrew, please. We don't want any scribbling in this class. You're liable not to be able to read it later on. You say, "Well, I can't read that." Well, that's all right. One of these days, if Jesus carries and we get through all this other stuff, we might go into Hebrew and Greek. Well, not too many applauds on that, so I better get off that subject. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you have enough trouble with English and not leaving any of your participles dangling? Hallelujah. 
Genesis, remember we get it from the Greek or Latin genesios, which means the origin or the, uh, where we get the word genesis from that. For the, for the Hebrews, it was better to. So I'm trying to find where my notes went. Okay, you got that down? Uh, yeah, I'll leave it up there a little bit longer. We'll be on chapter 4 beginning this evening if you want to open up and be turning there. Remember the book of Genesis, although it's divided into these 11 sections by the Toledotes, there's one overall division that we could give to the book, and that would be the first 11 chapters. Most of you didn't realize this last time, which deal with prehistoric history. Mankind in general, and then chapters 12 through 50 of the book of Genesis, which begin with uh, Israel, or begin with the ancestor, Abraham, of Israel. So you're following right in the footsteps of Moses, if you can get this written down. He didn't write it exactly like that, but um, it's close enough. Hebrew is changed, and... They've added vowels and vowel points. All these little dots that you see, those are the vowels. Your A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. That's just your little dots all over there. The rest of those letters are constant. But if you read it real well, you don't need the dots. You can just read the consonants and know where to put in the vowels. But since most people can't read it at all, we need to get all that put, in, put down. Better see, pull it out. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to be educational up here. So I want to be sure that you realize these things. We don't cut any corners around here. We're going to give you the full scope around here. That way no one can back you up in a corner and pull the rug out from under you with some precepts like Exodus 6, verses 2 and 3. You've got to eventually uh, deal with these things so no one can pull the rug out from underneath you. Okay, chapters 4 through 11, we'll try to get through that much this evening. I'll remind you again that we are skipping things with the purpose in mind that we're going to cover these things in the other class on creation. Now, if we were not having the other class being taught simultaneously with this class, that is the class on creation, then we'd have to go into these things in a little bit more detail, but remember this is still OT info, and we can't get too far off the track looking at something as exciting as creation and evolution, we still can't get off the track and look at something like that if we're trying to get to Old Testament introduction. Now, we finished in chapter 3 by me giving you a list of some of the immediate consequences of the fall. Now, whenever I give you a list like that in this class in OT intro, that doesn't mean that is an all-inclusive, exhaustive list of all the consequences that immediately resulted from the fall. It, it contains some of the obvious and some of the general consequences that immediately followed the fall. Now we're going to be looking in chapters 4 through 11 at some of the results of the fall, some of the long-range result, results from the fall, not as immediate as those consequences that I gave you in the end of chapter 3. So if you happen to be reading along, what I'm saying is if you happen to be reading in chapter 3 and you see another consequence, then uh, realize and understand it's not our purpose to be exhausted in this class. We'll come back to things like that under another study. Chapter 4 through chapter 11. Chapter 4, verse 1. We'll be looking at some of the results of the fall. That's what all these chapters go right into, the final results of the fall, then we'll finally sum that up with the power of Babel and the dispersion of the people into various nations, various cultures, various languages, various backgrounds, various geographical locations and habitations for these various people. And then we start in chapter 12 with Abraham. And Adon knew Chava, his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, from Yahweh. Now Eve has been named twice. We know her as Eve. She's been named twice, both times by her husband Adam, 
First of all, remember in chapter 2, we have Ish and Isha. There she is named by Adam on the basis of her sex. She's an Ish. Uh, she's an Isha, not an Ish. And whenever we come over here to chapter 3 and verse 20, you look there in chapter 3 and verse 20, then we have Eve named for a second time, and that is Tava, C-H-A-V-A-H. And whereas the first naming of Eve had to do with her sex, the naming, the second naming in Genesis 3.20 has to do with her function. No longer is she simply Isha, or female, or woman, because you can be a female and a woman and not be a mother, now, Adam sees something else in there. Of course, on the basis of verse 15, we talk, we've already mentioned to you this is your memory scripture, Genesis 3 15, seed of the woman. That means she's going to have to be given birth to someone or to something, somehow. And so, Adam, naming her for the second time, Kava, or Eve, gives her her name, which designates her function, and that is she will be the unique mother of all. Living. That's what the word means, living. And he, of course, gets the derivative meaning from it that she will be the mother of all living things. Now, that, of course, excludes the unconscious life of plants and the conscious life of animals. It deals only with the self conscious life which only a human being possesses. So, Adam and Eve get together for the first time here in God's commandment early in Genesis 1.28, and that is in favor of procreation, and they produce the first son, Cain. A lot of theories on exactly what Adam and Eve's frame of mind happened to be whenever they produced their first son. We're not going to get into them, but remember in Genesis 3.15, God had promised that through her seed something important was going to happen. It was going to, through her seed, we were going to have a destruction of both her enemy and her enemy's seed. Well, she's got a child here right away. Is this the seed that she's looking for? Well, we know it couldn't be because she ends up being our first mother. And she again bore his brother Abel. And Abel was the keeper of sheep, but Cain was a killer of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And see, all these chapters, now these first 11 chapters are just filled with theological things, and this is where you begin in Old Testament and Biblical theology, because Biblical theology, in essence, is the history of the redemption of mankind. And each one of these statements and each one of these phrases is always pointing in the final analysis towards man's redemption. And that's why God has given us this, this material. The same is true with this initial count of Cain and Abel. It's again pointing toward man's redemption because we see Abel, of course, we see Paul later in Scripture, the first martyr in the Bible. Now, the only way you can be a martyr is to die for some important cause. So remember that. You see, we just kill with people. Abel didn't just happen to get killed by his brother. If he's a martyr and Jesus classifies him, for instance, with Zechariah, who he says over in, I believe, Luke 11, says, Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, pays the king the altar in the temple, and he said that the blood of all the martyrs, all the prophets, from Abel, from Abel down to Zechariah, would be the fall of that generation. So to classify Abel with a man like Zechariah, and we've got 14 chapters of Zechariah's prophecy, we know that Abel must have been an important individual. We see him again over in Hebrews 11 in the roll call of faith. But Abel being a martyr died for some particular cause. The process of time that came to pass that came brought of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very rough, and his countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou rough, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be it, 
shouldn't be his, it should be the leader. It's desire, and thou shalt rule over it. The king talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, the king rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So the first eight verses of Genesis 4, we have the grace and differences between the first brothers, Cain and Abel. The grace and the differences between these two men. Now the first question that we might raise in looking at this passage, difficult passage with, in several respects, they're already bringing an offering to the Lord. Where in the world do they get this idea of bringing some kind of offering to the Lord? We don't get offerings until way over in the Mosaic legislation. And especially when it has to do with animal offerings, we don't see that over until the line of Moses. So why, we can ask, is God pleased with Abel's offering and displeased with Cain's offering? Simple question, but we have a twofold answer. And why God is pleased with Abel's offering and he's displeased with Cain's offering. First of all, the offering that Abel brought unto the Lord was a blood sacrifice, which we have only had hinted at one time before, and that's in Genesis 3, verse 21. The only hint that we've had so far. Genesis 3, and verse 21. So the first reason that God is pleased with Abel's sacrifice and displeased with the offering of Cain is that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, symbolic of work religion, that I think the Catholic Church must have picked up from Cain. And the Southern Baptists got it from them, and then all other denominations followed Cain thereafter. <laughs> well, you don't have to say amen, it's true anyway. Now, if you'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, People that don't believe the historicity of the first 11 chapters of Genesis are going to have a problem with the New Testament because it's remarkable they're always referring back to events that took place during those first 11 chapters of Genesis. And it seems to me that even Jesus himself had the impression that these things actually and historically took place. In other words, it didn't seem like Jesus was simply accommodating himself to the shallow belief, the mythological misconceptions that the people in the Middle East had during his time. Seems like he thought that actually these things actually took place, and men such as Adam actually existed. Hebrews 11, verse 4. Now this verse can mean a little more to you if you take it in light of Genesis 4. Out of all this long roll call of faith, we see the word faith mentioned 24 times in this chapter, many, many names, both male and female. Who do you think the first name is? By faith, Abel. Now, he did this by faith. You see, you don't get all this unless you're reading more than a Sunday school lesson in Genesis 4. He's offering this by faith. Now, what is faith? Well, two verses before, faith is the substance of things hoped for, it's the evidence of things not seen. Must have been something he was hoping for, and he was offering this sacrifice by faith in view of the reality that he couldn't yet see. I don't know if all of you are following. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Now, the Bible calls the sacrifice that he offered more excellent than the one that Cain offered. And of course, we know why. It's because it's a blood sacrifice. A more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, not depending upon himself or his own cultivation of the land, which is what Cain was depending upon, cultivating the land himself. This was an animal that he had nothing to do with, but he offered. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and look at this peculiar phrase, by it he being dead yet speaketh. Abel is still talking today. You see, that's what we look at under biblical theology. But Abel is still talking today by his more excellent sacrifice. The Paul tells us by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by he being dead yet speaketh. A second reason for God being pleased with Abel's offering over against Cain 
is that Abel's offering is explicitly called a first fruit offering, and Cain's is not. Now let's go back to the verses in Genesis 4 so you'll see this. Genesis 4 3. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now he's bringing an offering. But it's the offering many people offer today, and that's the humanistic offering of religiosity and church business. He's been busy cultivating his ground and raising his fruit. And Abel, he also brought of the fishing of his flock and of the flock thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Exodus chapter 23. You see what went on to be incorporated in the Mosaic legislation and law. Exodus 23, in the beginning of verse 17. We're able to get these ideas. You see, you're not reading us this afternoon. We have in verses 14 through 16, of course, the three annual feasts that everyone in which I had to participate in. Verse 17, three times in the year all the males shall appear before the Lord God. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven bread. Neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. Remember, fat was mentioned over there in Abel's sacrifice to his offering. Verse 19 is what we want. The first of the fish fruits of thy land, thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Well, the requirement was a first of the first fruits. Now, I'm looking at the various sacrifices that we see over in the first seven chapters of Leviticus, uh, most of these, of course, are blood sacrifices, and those are the ones that do atone for sin. But on various occasions, and with respect to various things that they had, of course, they were required to bring offerings of the fruit of the ground. But Cain is bringing his offering as a means of atonement, and that's not what God would allow. It has to be blood sacrifice, because he told us in the Word, or we'll see later on in the Word, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. It's not in the internal makeup of an acorn or of, uh, an ear of corn, but the life is in the blood. So although in several places we'll see them being first fruit also of the ground, back in Genesis 4, it had to be, this offering here had to be a blood sacrifice. But even if God had allowed back in Genesis 4 for them to bring the fruit of the ground and it would have been acceptable to them, it does not say that Cain brought the first and the first fruits of the ground. That's the point. He could have brought some old dried up piece of corn, ear corn. But it is clearly said of Abel that Abel brought of the first things of his flock. And under the Mosaic legislation, you couldn't bring a lamb that was so blemished. In any regard, or blind in one eye, that would be, would be rejected by the Lord and by the priest. But Abel is faithful in that he brings a, the first things of the flock. Cain sees, down in verse 8, and Cain talks with Abel his brother, and probably said, I read, our version leaves this out, but it's kind of mysterious, it just says they talk. He probably talked and said, let's go out in the field. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Verses 9 to 15, we have Cain's punishment. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? This is that other series of questions. Remember, we said that God would be asking over in chapter 4. I have to pay, pay close attention. I have to keep up with all of this. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? Now, God's not asking this in the sense that he needs to obtain some knowledge that he does not have before this. The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground, and now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou killest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me off this day from the face of the earth. 
and from thy faith shall I be healed. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore he shall the slay of king, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him to kill him. Now we see God's mercy being demonstrated toward Cain for the simple reason that we've got to have people reproducing on the earth, and God doesn't want to start executing the death penalty against everyone that does something wrong. Otherwise, we're not going to have Genesis 1.28 fulfilled where God told them to multiply and to replenish the earth. So we have, whatever this mark is, we're not told, but we have a mark placed upon Cain so that any that might find him would not take Cain's life. Verses 16 to 18, we have Cain's marriage and his posterity. Well, one thing I'd mentioned back up in verse 14, right in the middle of the verse, notice that he said, And from thy faith shall I be hid. In the beginning of verse 16, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. And you see, the Lord must have been somewhere specifically and particularly at this time. Remember, the first consequence of the fall that we said last time over in Genesis 3 is that they exited the presence of God. They wanted to stay away from the presence of God. It's interesting that Cain tells the Lord, Now I'm going to be healed from your faith. And he says in verse 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. So the Lord must have been dwelling in some particular place at that time, or otherwise we couldn't have this particular phrase mentioned that Cain went out from the Lord's presence. And he dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Egypt, so he hadn't left Egypt yet. He's still in Egypt. And Cain knew his wife, and he was she. And she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city. That is, Cain built a city. And called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and unto Irad Mahijael, and Mahijael begat Methuselah, and Methuselah begat Lamech. Then verses 19 to 24, we have the life of Lamech. Six verses here given to what becomes our first polygamy, because of course he marries two wives here. Gives us six verses there that have to do with Lamech his life, and his posterity. And Lamech took unto him two wives, the name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Jilla. Um, well, I don't want to get into that. Just remember, though, some other time, I guess we're looking at this, that Hebrew names are so important. All these names that we see always mean something. Remember that in the Occidental frame of mind, that is the Western terminology, in the Western frame of mind, Names aren't a big thing. You name them James, John, Paul, Philip, or something, just because you like the name, but it doesn't have a meaning to it. But that is totally different from the Oriental frame of mind and the Oriental context, where you would always name people uh, after some particular feature or outstanding characteristic about that individual. And on occasions, names would be changed. We have, like the name of Abram, changed from Abram to Abraham. We have Jacob's name go from Jacob to Israel. We have Joseph's name go from Joseph to Zachary to Elia. We have uh, Daniel's name changed. We have the three Hebrew children's names changed. All these names that we see in Scripture are all important for some reason. We don't want to look at all these names, but even the names of his two wives, Ada and Zillah, are interesting. And Ada bears Jabel. And he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal, so we have Jabal and Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the heart, an organ. Not an organ like the organ over here, it's a different type of organ. Zillah, she also bears Tubal king, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. The sister of Tubal king was Naaman. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, and hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man in my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. The king shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. We'll come back and comment on that. The last two verses, we have the birth of death. And Adam knew his wife again. She bare a son and called his name Seth. 
For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who came through. Well, right here in your own Bible, you have to be able to look over into the margin and at least see in English translation of what these various words mean. We get over to chapters 29 and 30 in the book of Genesis, and there you've got the 12 sons, and you've got 11 sons. Benjamin's not born until later on, but you've got the 11 sons of Jacob born in chapters 29 and 30, and you look just over in your margin. You don't even need a lexicon or anything, and you'll see some type of English uh, definition for each one of those names, like Reuben and Simeon, then Levi and Judah, and so forth, on his 11 sons mentioned in those two chapters. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, who called his name Enoch. Then men, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Does it mean now that Seth was their third born child? Though obviously he wasn't. He was born years down the road. So we've got Cain is called the first born. Abel is the second born. Then we've got many, many sons and daughters. You wouldn't get this from just looking in chapter 4. And then we have Seth born. Now don't think of him as born the third person in family because he wasn't. He had many brothers and sisters that were born before him. As a matter of fact, Seth was probably the youngest one in the family. Now what you need to remember overall about chapter 4 of Genesis, which is so interesting in itself, is that this chapter is known by people who study Genesis.